In 1910, Swiss psychiatrist Eugène Bleuler coined the Latin term autismus to describe, quote, the withdrawal of a patient to his fantasies, end quote. With this term, Bleuler was hoping to define one of the symptoms of schizophrenia. But then, in the 1920s, a Soviet child psychiatrist, Grunia Sukhrayeva, used the term to describe non-schizophrenic children in her care. In 1943, Austrian-American psychiatrist Leo Kanner was the first to use autism in the modern sense when he introduced the label early infantile autism to describe a group of 11 children with similar symptoms all treated at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And so we come to today's lesson on ASD. Autism Spectrum Disorder, ASD, is a type of pervasive developmental disorder in which those diagnosed with ASD struggle with social interaction and communication and exhibit repetitive and restrictive behaviors. It is a spectrum disorder in that individuals diagnosed with ASD can exhibit an incredibly wide variety of symptoms which may at times overlap with other diagnoses. Someone can be both autistic and have ADHD, or be autistic and be gifted academically or in some other way. Prior to the adoption of the DSM-5, ASD was often categorized as a set of five different disorders. Autistic disorder is the classical broad classification and identified individuals who are generally slow to hit major developmental milestones like the acquisition of spoken language. Asperger syndrome, first identified by Viennese psychologist Hans Hasberger in 1938, was the diagnosis for high-functioning autistic people. PPD, NOS, was the diagnosis given to individuals who didn't easily fit an autism disorder or Asperger's diagnosis because, for instance, they might not acquire language at all. Rett syndrome is a non-inherited neurological disorder that affects mostly girls and develops after the sixth month of life. Prior to that, infants hit major milestones, but then suddenly experience loss of coordination, speech, and the use of their hands. Finally, childhood disintegrative disorder, or Heller's syndrome, typically manifests between three and four years of age, later than typical autism. Individuals experience sudden developmental delays and often also experience reversals in development, including the loss of language, the loss of social function, and even motor skills like walking. Now classified more broadly as a spectrum disorder, individuals diagnosed with autism further fall into a position on that spectrum. While all individuals with autism require some kind of support in navigating communication and social interactions, individuals at level one need relatively little support, while individuals at levels two and three need increasing amounts of support to either navigate communication and social interactions, or, in the case with very low-functioning individuals with autism, may require a constant caregiver for day-to-day -day life. Most individuals with ASD are characterized as mild within the level one or level two spectrum. Autism symptoms typically emerge by the age of three, and in developed countries where most individuals have relatively easy access to health professionals, a diagnosis can be made within the first or second year of life. There are five signs and symptoms, typical, of individuals with ASD. Let's review those now. People with ASD often experience stimulus sensitivity, meaning that they are either overwhelmed by or oblivious to sensory input. For instance, someone with autism might refuse to wear certain fabrics because that fabric hurts or scratches their skin. They might avoid certain environments, usually very loud and chaotic environments, because their brains cannot process all of that noise easily. These sensory issues can result in significant communication impairment, not only because someone with ASD might avoid certain situations, but also because, in an effort to cut down on sensory overload, people with autism often avoid eye contact or might tend to look and listen less to the people in their environment and thus fail to respond to other people, even when someone's calling their name. Infants and toddlers with ASD often do not develop language skills at the same milestones as other children and, depending on where they fall on the spectrum, might not develop the ability to communicate with spoken language at all. Additionally, 
People living with ASD often respond unusually when others show anger, distress, or affection. They tend not to read the social cues that others pick up so naturally in early childhood and adolescence. As you can imagine, this difficulty in communicating may lead to anxiety and depression, meaning that an autism diagnosis can be an underlying cause for an anxiety or a mood disorder. And, obviously, when someone has trouble communicating in a way that seems or feels normal to most people, that usually leads to significant social impairment. Individuals with ASD may lack the ability to read and or interpret emotional cues. This is particularly a problem with interpersonal interaction, and their ability to sympathize is sometimes also lacking. Further, people who do not suffer from ASD often have a hard time reading or interpreting emotional cues from individuals with ASD, since people with ASD might not use easily recognizable cues to indicate emotion. For instance, when most people are angry or excited, they raise their voice. Someone with autism might instead whisper. When most people are sad, they don't smile. But someone with autism might regularly smile when they feel sad, which then confuses non-ASD individuals. Finally, individuals with ASD often engage in repetitive motions, like rocking back and forth or jumping up and down, sometimes saying the same word multiple times. They also sometimes engage in unusual behavior for their age group. For instance, an adolescent with autism might become overwhelmed by sensory input and have a tantrum, which most people associate as toddler behavior. Now, some individuals with autism might have intensely focused interests. And a few are even so highly gifted in one specific area that they are called geniuses or prodigies or savants. These focused interests might be evident even in a person with severe autism who is nonverbal. They might still show passionate interest in drawing or in Disney movies or in playing music. Oh, it is also true that individuals with autism need structure and that even small changes in routine can cause anxiety. So, for instance, fire drills in a school setting can be supremely upsetting for someone with autism. Not only is the loud noise of the alarm itself sensory overload, but then you have lots of people who are pushing in one direction, and sometimes they're touching you, they're pushing you, and you have the interruption of the regular school day. Prior to the DSM-5, Asperger's syndrome, or AS, was its own diagnosis. Now. Asperger's is considered the high-functioning end of ASD. Most people with Asperger's have no real cognitive impairment, but exhibit the same problems with what is considered normal communication and social interaction as other people with ASD. Very often, people with AS find professional success because of their intense interest or focus in one discipline. In the United States, AS has been somewhat normalized by the inclusion of characters with Asperger's in TV series. The Crime Procedural Bones, which premiered in 2005 and ran for 12 seasons, revolved around Dr. Temperance Brennan, a forensic anthropologist who was diagnosed with Asperger's. The sitcom Big Bang Theory, which premiered in 2007 and also ran for 12 seasons, revolved around a group of scientists, one of whom, Dr. Sheldon Cooper, also exhibited some traditional behaviors especially social awkwardness, of Asperger's. For people with a more traditional autism disorder diagnosis, what non-ASD people might call success has been more difficult. In 1947, Mary Temple Grandin was the first child born to a wealthy Boston family. She failed to meet developmental milestones and, at the age of two, was diagnosed with brain damage. As Temple's sisters and brother joined the family, her developmental delays were made more evident. Doctors suggested the typical treatment for such a diagnosis, institutionalization. A Temple's mother refused that option, instead hiring a nanny to play educational games with her daughter and taking her daughter to speech therapy sessions at Boston hospitals. Despite her sensory sensitivities and some unusual behaviors, Temple attended traditional schools with her siblings. When she was about 15, Temple's mother discovered a checklist for autism disorder and realized that her daughter was likely autistic, and the recommended treatment for autism was institutionalization. 
Well, by this time, Temple's behavior had caused tension between her parents. Her father wanted her institutionalized, while her mother refused. Her parents divorced over this issue, and her mother eventually remarried. Temple's step-aunt had a ranch in Arizona, on which Temple spent one summer. It was there she found her overwhelming focus, animals. Despite a diagnosis that historically would have meant Temple could never be typically successful in life, she proved everyone wrong. She attended university, eventually earning a PhD in animal science in 1989. Temple first wrote about her journey in a 1986 book called Labeled Autistic. In it, she described her daily life, her insistence on wearing comfortable clothing because of sensory processing overload, her preference for standing outside of crowds for the same reason, her amazing visual memory, which allows her to work with animals so successfully. In subsequent books about her work and lived experience as a person with autism, she has also delved into the secondary disorders, like depression, with which autistic people are also often diagnosed. She's honest about her need to take antidepressants to manage her depression. Since then, and besides her day job as a professor at Colorado State University, she has become both an international spokesperson for autism and an advocate for the humane treatment of livestock for slaughter. Temple's ability to write about her experiences as an autistic person, to articulate what it's like to live with autism, provided an enormous push for greater research into autism and, specifically, into therapies for autistic people. Based on her own experiences, thanks to activities organized by her mother and elementary school teachers, Temple Grandin advocates for early and consistent interventions for children with autism. In 2010, HBO produced a semi-biographical miniseries of Temple Grandin's life. This miniseries won the Outstanding Television Movie Primetime Emmy Award that year and allowed for her even greater advocacy of people with autism. So, what causes autism? Well, like almost all psychological disorders, there are multiple causes for the disorder. One thing researchers can quite confidently say, however, is that vaccines do not cause autism. The vaccine controversy began in 1998, when British doctor Andrew Wakefield published a paper in the medical journal The Lancet called MMR Vaccine and Autism. This paper coined a new syndrome, autistic enterocolitis, and claimed a connection between bowel disease, the MMR vaccine, and autism. Simply, Wakefield and his fellow researchers noted that in a study of 12 children diagnosed with autism, eight of them had developed autistic symptoms after their MMR injection, and one had developed them after a measles injection. While the paper itself never directly stated causation, in lectures and conferences prior to and after its publication, Wakefield publicly stated that vaccines were, if not the cause of autism, then certainly a cause of autism. In interviews, Wakefield suggested that, at the very least, parents vaccinate their children with the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines separately, with a gap of one year between each vaccine, or to avoid these vaccinations of choice entirely. For this reason, Wakefield is often referred to as the father of the anti-vax movement. In reality, the movement predates Wakefield's 1998 paper, but then he was already advocating against too much vaccination prior to 98 as well. Now, some parents whose children were diagnosed with ASD and parents of infants who wanted to avoid ASD stopped vaccinating their children altogether, leading to a spike in measles, mumps, and rubella cases primarily in the developed world. In the early 2000s, groups of scientists around the world attempted to replicate Wakefield's experiments and were unable to do so. They concluded that either Wakefield's results were a fluke or that he'd committed fraud to obtain those results. In the ensuing years, it was revealed that there were a number of problems with Wakefield's research as presented. Most notably, some of the children in the study had shown symptoms of autism months before their MMR vaccination. Moreover, one of the children didn't show symptoms of autism until several months after the MMR vaccination not exactly the quick causation Wakefield had claimed. Moreover, Wakefield did have conflicts of interest. 
Even as he was working on the research for the 1998 paper, he was developing diagnostic tests for autistic enterocolitis and was involved in litigation against the manufacturers of the MMR vaccine. In fact, that's how he met most of the patients in his study. The parents were all suing MMR vaccine manufacturers. Well, the Lancet would retract the paper in 2010. Dr. Wakefield was charged with professional misconduct and his name stricken from the UK's medical register that same year. Wakefield would eventually leave the UK for the United States, where he continues to be active in the anti-vaccination movement. At last report, Wakefield was living in Austin, Texas. In reality, there are many causes for ASD, and likely no one singular factor which always causes autism in individuals. There are genetic factors at play. Research has shown that some syndromes which develop from random mutation, like Rett's, predisposes an individual to autism. But there may also be some as yet unknown inherited genetic factors. There are also likely environmental factors at play, although research is still very much ongoing with these causes. Researchers are exploring whether environmental toxins experienced while in utero or a mother's viral infections or other complications during pregnancy are correlated with the development of autism. Despite not knowing exact causes of ASD, researchers have nonetheless identified some risk factors which sometimes correlate with ASD. One of the risk factors is biological sex. Males are four times more likely to develop ASD than are females. Then again, that statistic might just be a problem with testing. Another risk factor is family history. While a gene for autism has never been identified, research has also noted that parents who have one child with ASD have a higher risk of having more children with ASD. Extremely preterm babies, those born before 26 weeks of gestation, are also at greater risk of developing ASD. Finally, some research suggests a correlation between parental age and ASD but the connection is still very vague. More research needs to be done. While there is no way to prevent autism, there are now many varied treatment options. The most important factor is early diagnosis. With early diagnosis, interventions and therapies can be developed, which help people with ASD navigate a world that often seems chaotic and confusing. Even when early diagnosis isn't possible, intervention has always shown to be beneficial. While individuals with ASD don't outgrow their symptoms, most people with ASD can learn to function well in society, and they just become a part of our neurodiverse environment.